afternoon and welcome to our insightful um, discussion on empowering excellence of women in football in celebration of International Women's Day. My name is Magda De Lange. I'm an advisor at um, the Leaders Development Institute, also known as LDI, at the Ministry of Sport. And it's both an honor and a privilege to be your moderator for this significant panel discussion. Today, we gather to explore the evolving landscape of women's football, aligning with the theme of International Women's Day to inspire inclusion. International Women's Day serves as a powerful platform to celebrate the remarkable achievements of women across the globe. By highlighting the importance of inclusion, International Women's Day encourages us to amplify the voices of women, fostering a more equitable and diverse world where collaboration and understanding flourish. This event also serves as a strategic output of the LDI, recognizing the critical role that women play in shaping the future of sports and society at large. Together, we can build a sports culture that values the contributions of every woman and promotes a culture of empowerment, respect, and unity. This panel discussion is not only a dialogue, it's a celebration of progress, an acknowledgement of the hurdles we overcame, and a testament to the resilience and determination of women athletes. At the heart of our conversation lies the profound commitment of the Saudi Ministry of Sport, and all the eye to empowering women's sports, a critical objective intricately woven into the fabric of Saudi Vision 2030. We have a distinguished panel of experts, each bringing a unique perspective and wealth of experience to shed light on the progress, challenges and prospects of Saudi women in sports. First, me, first, uh, firstly, let me introduce our esteemed panelists. We have Monica Starr, who took on the role of Women's Football Technical Director at the Saudi Arabian Football Federation, SAF, after one and a half years as the women's national team's first ever head coach. Monica's presence adds a unique dimension, offering perspectives grounded in her first-hand experience navigating the complexities of women's football development, both internationally as well as locally. Her role as a mentor and guide for aspiring Saudi women footballers serve as an inspiration, showcasing the evolving landscape of opportunities for women in sports within the Saudi Arabian context. Her Royal Highness Princess Reem Abdullah, CEO of Women's Football at Al Shabaab Saudi Club. Her Royal Highness's role involves not only the strategic development of women's football within the club, but also collaboration with national and international organizations to elevate the status of women's sports in Saudi Arabia. Her influence catalyzes positive change that set new standards for women's football in the country. We also welcome Dr. Eva Ferrer, female sport health specialist at FC Barcelona Innovation Hub and member of the Women's Health Expert Panel at UEFA. As a sports medicine specialist, Dr. Ferrer contributes her experience in addressing the unique health and wellness considerations for female athletes. Her insights into the intersection of sports and healthcare will enrich our understanding of the holistic development of women in sports. And then lastly, but not the least, welcome also to Hani Thalgie, Public Relations Manager at FIFA. She's the co-founder and captain of Women's Football in Palestine and the first Arab woman to obtain a FIFA Masters. Hani's presence on the panel adds a unique dimension to the conversation, offering not only global perspective through her FIFA role, but also a deeply personal and inspirational story as a player and captain. 
Her journey serves as a testament to the transformative power of sports in breaking down barriers and empower women in traditionally male-dominated fields. The collective expertise of these panelists promise, promises a comprehensive understanding of the challenges and triumphs within women's football, both globally and specifically within the unique context of Saudi Arabia. Today, our panel will cover key aspects of women's football in Saudi Arabia. We will discuss the evolution of the sport, the challenges faced by Saudi women in football, and the resilience needed to overcome these obstacles. Our conversation will highlight both success stories and crimes that have paved the way for excellence, not only by our Saudi footballers, but also beyond. We'll also explore sports medicine, dissecting how Barcelona's females became unstoppable with the support of a trailblazing doctor. Lastly, we will talk about the vital role of empowerment initiatives and support networks in fostering an environment for the growth and empowerment of women in football. This session, therefore, offers a comprehensive exploration of the various facets of women's football in Saudi Arabia. I encourage our audience to actively participate in this dialogue by posing questions and sharing perspectives. You are welcome to send your questions in English, English through the chat function. We will have 20 minutes to half an hour to handle questions. Let us collectively explore the multifaceted journey of women footballers and contribute to the ongoing dialogue surrounding female athletic development in the kingdom. As we embark on this journey of insight and reflections, let us collectively contribute to the narrative of progress, equality, and empowerment of Saudi women's sports. Monica, you are the embodiment of our topic, empowering excellence, overcoming challenges, and unveiling the triumphs of Saudi women in football. Could you provide, provide us with insights into the current reality? Um, specifically, we would like to hear about the challenges that you faced um, and the progress that you've witnessed in your work. Well, welcome to everyone and thanks for this invitation. I'm really, really happy to be here in such a panel and uh, especially tomorrow is the Women Day, so we get some attention. I always like this and uh, I just can tell you that I've been here now already two and a half years and uh, it's amazing, a really amazing story uh, how progress was made in this short period of time. And I think you have to be here to be in Saudi to believe what is happening here in, in Saudi Arabia women football. And um, I think uh, we have done achievement like uh, having the national team, the A national team. We started uh, with the first game in the Maldives. And uh, I remember when, when my player said, coach, uh, this is a big stadium. Are we playing there? Yes, yes, we're going to play a match. Uh, tomorrow and uh, uh, it was amazing for them to, to to feel this the first time to play 11 aside in a big stadium in the Maldives. We won the first two games, this is always good. So now we have played 22 matches. We entered last year in the FIFA ranking, which is also, I think, important to show Saudi Arabia has women football. We did a very, very great documentary. I'm sure, honey, you have seen that and everyone about how these players feel to play now the game, to be part of the game and not to be excluded. And uh, we started with the under 17 national team last year. I remember the first game we lost 18-0. Now we only lose 1-2-0 in the training match. And uh, we have played already eight matches in the under 17. And we made history yesterday because we established the under-20 national team in such a short period of time. And Reem just uh, really gave that confirmation how these players develop in a really, really short time, how they're eager to learn, how they are ready to play the game. 
and to make really history in Saudi Arabia for the first time, having all these national teams. We are looking for the under 15 national team in the pipeline. So we hope to have more young players showing them the pathway, showing them where is their way to go when they are, let's say, even four, five years, six, seven years old, as we have established regional training center in the main three cities, Jeddah, Daman, and Riyadh, and we have these young players, and believe me, whenever I have the time to go to these RTCs, we call them, my heart is bleeding to see so many young, really talented young Saudi players who want to play the game. And I didn't expect that when I actually started, I have to tell that. And also in the school, we started uh, last year with 48,000 participation of school kids playing the school league. And this year we had over 70,000. So, so something is happening here in Saudi Arabia. And for me, it was also astonished to see how they love football. I didn't expect that. I was working in Bahrain, I was working in Qatar, and I think in many, many countries, but I haven't seen such a crazy nation in a positive way about uh, football in general and to see all the games. And we have now the league, the Premier League also. I was really surprised that eight uh, top men clubs uh, decided to have women in their, uh, in their uh, clubs. and. And all of them, Hilal, Al Nasser, Al Shabab, Al Ali, or Etihad, I hope I pronounced them correctly, they all said, yes, we want women football. And, and I said, it took Germany 30 years to have Bayern Munich and Wolfsburg and all these traditional men, uh, first division clubs, to, to have actually a women team. And here they are supportive. So this is really great to see. We started with uh, 16 teams now. We have uh, 31 teams in the first division. And we have the cup competition played this year, and we have the cup final. Al Shabab can be the big winner. And also, we played the under 17 tournament just recently. And congratulations, Reem, your team, Al Shabab, won this tournament for the first time. So, we are looking for a good competition to looking for champions. So, I believe Saudi Arabia can be very proud of what is happening here. And uh, I always, whenever I give an interview or when I have a chance to talk about Saudi women football, I have to mention three names. These are, I know uh, if I pronounce them correctly, Atwa Arifi, the deputy sports minister, I'm sure everybody knows her. Uh, Lamia Bayan, she's now the vice president of the Football Federation. And of course, Alia Rashid, she is the director of women football. And I tell you, these three power women are incredible, passionate, committed, uh, competent, humble. They, they know what they want and they are so supportive. And it's such a pleasure to work with these three women together and to have one aim. And that's what their aim is and their dream to go to the World Cup one day, to play the World Cup. And not even they want to play, they want to win the World Cup. So uh, this is a big ambitious, but I believe the way we are moving forward in such a short period of time, only two and a half years, maybe one day this will happen. And uh, it's also important to say that these three women played football together. And I know Reem, she knows that time, she played with them all together in Yamama. And they started uh, 2007, I think, uh, playing competition. So it's not women football in Saudi just suddenly is invented. It was structured 2018 when they started with the FA to get uh, uh, the structure and the recognition of the Football Federation. 2019, they had the first futsal team playing in uh, Kuwait, I believe, and that was the first participation in the futsal national team. And just the Department of Women Football, when I started, we had two people. Now we have over 31. It's, it's just incredible what is happening there. And, and also we do coaching courses. We have now 28 B license. We are just doing two A license women coaches. And, and that's great to see how many teachers are getting the D license. Over 1,000 teachers, we got T, D license and over 180 C license coaches. So I believe that this is something as a whole to look at such a great three people, Atwa, Lamia and, and Alia, to, to make this happening. And, and that's what I never felt in 90 countries I've been around to have such a, 
uh, pleasure to work and also to, to feel that passion for that game and to develop women football. And it's not only for Saudi, it's for the whole region, which I believe is really important. Like we saw the first World Cup player in Australia with work, uh, playing with a hijab from Morocco. And that makes me so happy that everyone in the world who wants to play can play. It doesn't matter where they come from. Thank you, Monica. The passion is absolutely clear. I have to say it's, it's thrilling to live in a country like Saudi Arabia at the moment. And I wish the whole world will know and see and understand this. And I think we have such an important role also to share this information with the rest of the world who, who has absolutely no idea. What I think is really, really nice is that that passion is fed throughout from the top level down to the player level. And when you have passion like this, it's not only a dream. You can literally move mountains. It's, it's just a question of time. And time is not our enemy here. It's definitely our friend. I, I would like to know from Princess Reem, from following from what Monica just shared with us, as the CEO of Women's Football at Al Shabab Club, what is your perspective and experience of, of how Saudi women navigated obstacles also in their football journey? Are there any um, specific challenges maybe that they or you as the CEO um, face that merit the candid conversation? Uh, first off, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's truly is a pleasure to share the panel with a passionate woman who I'm sure sacrificed a lot for the sport and to get it to the place that it is today. I think when I talk about uh, women football in Saudi, I'll have to go back to the history of it to talk about the challenges because, um, you know, we started in 2007. Uh, we played for 13 to 15 years in a grassroots level, and it was really passionate girls who came together and they wanted to play. We weren't thinking maybe what will happen and what is the outcome of this, but we all knew that one day we will reach a place where we will have a national team and we will have a, uh, uh, something more sustainable and more support when it comes to women football. So I would say at the time, the hardest thing was to advocate for the sport and find players more than anything. Uh, and then now, honestly, um, obviously there are the day-to-day -day challenges when you are trying to compete, for example, at Al-Shabaab or, or any other club. But I think the number one challenge that we face isn't, I mean, we have honesty, and I'm not just saying this because it's... Um, because I'm a Saudi woman or because I'm passionate about uh, women football, but we have received tremendous support from the Saudi Football Federation and from uh, the people in Saudi Arabia when it comes to women football. Uh, I think when it comes to succeeding, we have all the tools to succeed. It's really about educating the players at this stage on, on how to become professional players, um, how to act as prof professional players. Uh, so just really working on on that aspect with the players is just uh, moving from from it being just a hobby to being professional and especially that they have i think a, a big um, responsibility uh, because they are the first in this so they set the tone they set the attitude whether it's at the teams at the clubs or the national team the way they act their their dna as a team this is where it starts and i think it's a very important stage because whatever you do now will affect the future in 15 or 20 years and, and how players perceive things and adapt to things. So I think this is the most important thing as um, a CEO or even any managers of the club is really just building the right environment and mindset and being aware uh, of the player's situation and helping them adapt to this change from it being just a hobby to it being a professional uh, job by the end of the day. So I would say this is the number one thing that as a CEO I don't face a problem rather than want to avoid this problem and give them the right tools to to avoid this problem. So I would say this is the number one thing. Yes, and uh, when you have the correct tone and attitude again, you're halfway there. Um, uh, that's everything. Because when you sit with a, a negative scenario, it's very, very difficult to, to turn that around into a more positive culture. But uh, Saudi in general is a space with an incredibly positive tone and attitude. I mean, that is 
evident throughout life here every single day. Dr. Eva, AC Barcelona Femini went from great to absolutely unstoppable. In this journey, the role of sports medicine in overcoming challenges is absolutely crucial. Can you describe the work methodology FC Barcelona is using with its women team and how it has worked with the players to achieve better um, performance? First of all, I want to thank the organization for this kind invitation. And uh, it's a real pleasure for me to share my experience with this super passionate panel of women that, uh, as Monica uh, said, um, and she explained, to have such a broad number of, of girls and women playing is uh, exciting because you know that you have a long way to go and that's something that can encourage you to, to work better, right? So um, I can tell you that of course, sports medicine is uh, something that uh, has to be part of the basis when you're looking to performance. But of course, and for me, the first point is health. If you don't have healthy players, you won't have healthy performers. So that's basic. So, of course, we talk about sports medicine, but first of all, we should talk about medicine and health. Um, I, I am lucky that I'm in a club that we can have the same for women and men. So health health issues are the same for women and men. And men. So there's no difference between one uh, team or the other. And I'm sure that one of the valid points is uh, to work as a team. It doesn't make any sense that sports medicine works uh, on itself without having the coaches, the physical uh, physical uh, trainers, uh, physical coaches all together. The, the way that we have worked and, and that we've been still working is that work as a team and listen. It's basic to listen to the needs of the players. You have to take into the consideration that a team can be 24, 26, 30 players, and if you have all the B teams plus the academy, and, and you know that FC Barcelona is one of the teams that has youth players that play with the A team, you have to be sure that all of them have the same attention and that you have to accompany them that so they are sure and they uh, feel secure once they start playing. So the first thing that I would recommend anyone that wants to be sure that they are giving a good attention is to start from the basis. Start from the basis means that you have to know each and every player, listen to their needs, listen to their complaints, and then you can adapt that to performance. That of course, if you're in a football team or whatever team you are, but in a football team, you want to win, as we have mentioned and we have heard before. You want to play the World Cup and you want to win that World Cup, but you have to have healthy players to do that. So that's one of the bases. Listen and accompany them to what they need. That's one of the first things that I would say related to sports medicine. And then if you can do research, if you can grow a little bit bigger, that will come later on. But the basis is listen and accompany them. Thank you. Yes, the, the point about listening um, today, especially where there's such a great focus also on empathy as a skill, I think is absolutely crucial. Honey, I'm not sure whether somebody listened to you when you were playing. But Dr. Eva just highlighted the crucial role of sports medicine. Um, you have a personal story with a different outcome. Following a series of knee injuries, you directed your focus to empowering the next generation. Of course, then you had a great group of people listening to you. I'm just not sure what happened um, during your injury phase. Um, mm -hmm. You are a role model to women and girls throughout the Arab world and an inspiration to all who dream to live life abundantly. Can you share your story? Uh, 
Thank you very much for the invitation. It's definitely my honor to be with here with you here today. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu al mar'a al-Saudiya, wa kul aam wa intu b'khair, wa al-mar'a b'khair, wa inshallah al-mar'a al-Arabiya, wa al-Saudiya, wa al-Palestiniya, bidal b'ta'alluq bin-najah. So happy International Days uh, to everyone. And it, uh, it's important that we celebrate women, we celebrate the success of all these individuals, and we celebrate um, every moment uh, of women's football, because what we have reached so far since I started, it's uh, just impressive. Um, I mean, talking about um, how did it all happen, uh, of course, um, I was just playing uh, in the narrow streets of Bethlehem uh, in Palestine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, through many difficult challenges, uh, the political, the cultural, the social, but I always had um, this um, uh, uh, this uh, instinct to just go to the streets um, and play football with the boys. Uh, what, one of the reasons, I believe, because I never had any other options growing up in a, such a difficult uh, context, uh, growing up in a war zone, um, uh, with a big family, uh, two brothers and two sisters in one small house, um, I believe I didn't have any option. I just had to see the boys playing in the streets so I could join them and kick around uh, with the ball. And uh, uh, kicking around with the ball, I realized that uh, I love this uh, game and uh, I'm very connected to it. Uh, of course, after watching it uh, um, on TV with my parents, with my dad specifically, and brothers uh, on the, our black and white TV at that time. That doesn't mean I'm very old, be careful. <laughs> but that was the situation that time. So um, uh, just watching it and like trying to implement it on the ground, I realized that I'm in love with that, uh, uh, with that game, you know. So the passion increased and increased and increased. Uh, when everyone was against it, actually, like uh, specifically my dad, who thought that uh, no girls are not allowed to play football, I should be at home. But uh, of course, he never had a good um, justification for me why I should not be in the streets where at the same time my brothers were in the streets playing football. So he never came up with a good answer. That's why I never stopped. So I continued to play and I never took a no uh, for an answer uh, from him or from the community around because everyone was against girls playing football. Uh, everyone thought at 15, 16, I will stop playing football. But then I realized at that age that football is much more than the game. It started to become about identity as a Palestinian woman. It started to become about hope, about resilience about opportunities, about empowerment, about uh, bringing people together, about uh, uh, diversity and inclusion, all these topics uh, became my topics, actually. Um, and that's where we started to found the women's national team around 2002, 2003. Um, and then uh, we started to, uh, from Bethlehem University, and then we started to grow. In, in fact, we started as a national team rather than clubs or leagues, because we never had girls playing football. We were the first team ever to start uh, the women's uh, team uh, in Bethlehem University. And after that, everyone started to know about it. We tried to discuss with the Federation. The Federation discussed with FIFA. Of course, FIFA at that time were giving a lot of support to member associations to women's football. At that time, there was a percentage dedicated um, uh, for women's football, so each Federation had to implement this percentage otherwise they will not get the full funding and there were started to grow and grow and grow and then from just five players started to kick around on asphalt concrete uh, football pitches to now we have hundreds and thousands of girls in palestine playing football in fact just monica mentioned now that they were in the uh, west asia championship in saudi arabia in jeddah they played with the teams despite of all the challenges we managed to go to the second round and that's a great success for how women football in Palestine, uh, uh, you know, from nothing to uh, to the from the impossible to the possible. That's how I always say it, you know, like uh, growing up in such a context. And of course, you know, playing on asphalt and uh, bad infrastructure or um, poor, I would say, infrastructure in a context where everything is unstable, unpredictable, insecure. Um, we also faced a lot of injuries and a lot of uh, incidents, um, and uh, I was one of them, unfortunately. Um, uh, and that's where my career in football stopped uh, playing football because of the injuries, specifically my ACL was ruptured um, several times. Uh, but then I thought, okay, what is next? Because I thought that uh, 
for me, women's football, of course, the dream, as uh, Monica mentioned as well, for Saudi Arabia is to play one day in the Women's World Cup and to win. Um, but in my time, my dream was to take uh, uh, the women's football to another level, to just also communicate a different narrative of the Palestinian people to the world as well through football, you know, because it's a tool to bring people together, regardless of gender, nationality, ethnicity, it unites the world. And, and uh, it gives opportunities and hope. And that was my main uh, goal uh, through bringing the women's football up, up forward. And that's why when I uh, had my football injuries, I started to think what's next. But, you know, growing up in, in Palestine, I always had a dream to one day work at FIFA where the umbrella is uh, for football. And um, when everyone told me it's impossible, I believed it was possible. In fact, uh, one of the coaches I'm inspired by was Monica. And it's so honored always to be with her and um, uh, share a panel with her because she was also among the coaches, the first coaches that I met when I was just a player to get some courses um, to, uh, you know, to see what will happen after the football career. So that inspiration also came. In fact, actually, I remember the first Adidas shoes, football shoes that I got was through the courses uh, that Monica was involved in when I was only 20, uh, 22. Um, uh, that's when I, I got my uh, proper football shoes. And, you know, now the shift, how I shifted from playing football in the streets of Bethlehem to the world stages of FIFA and beyond, I now have this message to inspire the new generation through the FIFA platform, what we do around the 211 member association, but also this feeling that I have now, I have it through uh, uh, FIFA, because when we go around the world to develop women's football in Saudi Arabia or many other places, refugee camps, uh, slums areas and we just give them this simple equipment that includes a football shoes and when i see the girls their smiles on their faces just getting this football shoes it reminds me of that moment when i got that football shoes that changed uh, my life uh, in terms of uh, i'm playing now with the proper shoes so i understand the feeling from this player to now this uh, uh, administrator who works for fifa uh, for the last 12 years so that's how it's shifted from the injury to go to another level. But of course, I still suffer from the injuries. But, you know, at my time, there was no studies, enough studies for women's football. But now, as Eva mentioned, it has changed. And now there is a big awareness about ACL. Of course, the rates for women's football is more than men's football in ACL. But it's not as what the media portray. We have done uh, some researches uh, together with also UEFA, ACA, and uh, international organization to analyze what's happening in the ACL in women's football, why it's more uh, compared to men. And of course, there's, we don't have enough research. And that's why it's important that also government bodies, organizations do enough research to analyze uh, what's going on in terms of injuries, how girls can continue to play, um, what happens into the rehabilitation. Because in my uh, uh, time, I didn't have enough rehabilitation to go back stronger to football. In fact, when I came back, I got another injury. Um, and that's why it helps now to see FIFA collaborating with these organizations, supporting projects that they are relevant to uh, ACL and other injuries, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and also like um, showing that uh, there is a huge interest of elevate, el uh, putting women's football up forward in terms of all topics, whether it's injuries, whether it's development programs that uh, FIFA are also doing all around the world. And you know what we had, what, what, what we did with Saudi Arabia and uh, the movie Destined to Play, it's very impressive. That shows all the stories of women's football at all levels. So, yes, it has changed. And now here I am um, to carry on uh, this uh, uh, work and uh, try to uh, bring it to others uh, as much as I could through the platform that I have. Thank you. Thank you, honey. It's, it, it is an astounding story. And I have two points to make here. I think you just coined the title of the follow-up conversation because I, I really think we need to have more than just one conversation here. And that is that football is more than just the game. That in itself is such an incredibly powerful statement. And I can see so many conversations taking place just from uttering that one phrase. And then, of course, at the LDI, we are also doing research gaps analysis, and I definitely take note of the ACL 
Um, I, I put this aside as a note. So when, when we have our full analysis completed, just to see um, where this might fit in, it's, uh, thank you so much for mentioning this. It, it really helps us also to know from people on the ground what, what is happening and where there might be any research gaps. Um, interestingly, here in the Kingdom, we have the Saudi um, Sports for All Federation, which drives community sports. Um, uh, we invited them, but sadly they couldn't be here today, and we hope to welcome them on board next time. Um, the Global Goals World Cup 2024 final is taking place today here in Riyadh, and they all involved there. Um, so, yes, for sure, we would love to include them in our conversation next time. Princess Reem, I think uh, throughout this conversation, the word young youth goals um, it kept on popping up. The, the discussion took us to the focus on younger girls. And Al Shabab was just crowned the champions of the inaugural Saudi Arabian Football Federation of the Women's Under 17 um, tournament. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, could you elaborate on the significant times or milestones your club has achieved in advancing women's football, especially for the younger girls? Yes, if definitely. We can hear more about that. Definitely. Well, um, so basically, you know, we won the under 17 championship and we've reached the final of the um, uh, cup. And we're, I think we, we have a huge chance on finish, finishing the second in the league. So, and we won Saudi games in futsal. So I think in terms of competitions, we've done really well. But honestly, if you'd ask me about the milestones, it's not about the games that we played or won. It's really about the infrastructure and the establishment that Al Shabab is doing in hiring a CEO for women football and making sure that, you know, even when it comes to the medical team, we have the top medical team uh, with us uh, at the club. Um, we train at the same facilities that the men train in. So, uh, you know, seeing this or talking about this um, is important because I feel like uh, establishing at this stage the right, um, you know, starting it the right way is the most important because when you speak about women football, and especially if we want to accomplish something, not just uh, at the clubs, but at a national team level, we need to have the right infrastructure and we need to have uh, strategies that don't just look for today, but also the future and the development of these players, whether it's in the medical field, which I completely agree. I think it's the most important thing uh, uh, for a player is the, the medical team really because they keep the player intact even for a club as an investment when you get those players if they're injured half of the time and not uh, and you don't have a good medical medical team then you face a big problem because if you look at uh, players in a business point of view which is always very hard for passionate uh, footballers especially and people who work at football to not look at the sport with much passion but if you do take the the emotions aside and think of it, you're really losing a lot when you don't have a good, um, like let's say if a player's salary is an X amount and they're out for, for three weeks, then you really you lose the value of this player. So it's really important. And also you have a responsibility as a CEO and as a club to, to ensure that, you know, the longevity of this player in, in their field, because they put their trust in you and they chose to come to your club. They chose to, to give all they have at the field. So you need to back them up from, from the other side, um, I think I would say the most important when it comes to the youth and working with the youth is really their mindset, putting them in difficult situations, not expecting results from them when it comes to matches, but expecting how they behave and, and how they carry themselves during these games. I think, uh, you know, we've all mentioned, um, I think we all share a similar story when it comes to starting football. We all thought, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that you were the only female in the world that plays football. I think this is one of the impressions that we all lived through where I'm the only girl and we didn't have this opportunity to play and so on. So I think this is why it's really important to have passionate women who have been through the struggle, no matter where they're at in the world, to um, lead and direct and help those younger players but also help the organizations and let's say in the men's team and in uh, and the higher um, or the president of the club or the federation. You know, you, you need to have someone who understands the struggles, but also understands the uh, uh, understands on, on the best way to deliver these messages to the higher uh, 
uh, higher people who have higher power, I would say, in making decisions. So I would say, you know, th this is basically it. I would uh, really focus on the under 17. I would consider it an achievement, not now. I would consider it an achievement in 10 years when we have top national team players, when we have top uh, uh, top uh, leagues, not just like I don't want just Al-Shabaab to succeed because I know whatever I do and whatever standard I set at the club, if the national team isn't doing the same, the clubs won't do the same. So the national team really set a standard. And then now the players go to these uh, to, to the camps, let's say, come back and they know what to expect. They know they should have a good medical team. They know the type of uh, uh, facilities they should be training in. They're more aware of those things, which lets us as clubs even push our standards higher, not just for the players, but also in commercially, like how to market the players, how to market the club, how to get more more people attending the attending the games, but also trusting in our our message and our passion and our story. So I think these things are really important uh, in order for an organization to succeed, not just the pitch, but what goes on outside of the pitch and really putting yourself or putting the benefit of the players before anything else, before, before, um, before yourself, before your club, before the national team, uh, putting, and, I, and I'm sure the national team also shares the same idea and the same story. So I think these are these are the challenges that we face, but these are the opportunities that we have um, from my side. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and when you have somebody who has had challenges in their lives off the pitch, and you come and also challenge them on the pitch, these are people that naturally build grit and resilience and perseverance. And such a person, you can take so much further then. A hundred percent. I mean, you have to understand that these players' careers, um, it's 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 a big, or I would say it's it's a risk when when a player says I want to, like when someone says I want to be a football player, there is a type of risk that they're taking, which is as you said, you can face an injury, and uh, be young, and then that's it for you, and you've put all your life into training and to becoming a player. So I feel like when it comes to my players and the way I like to communicate with them is i always say football is really teaches you how to live life i mean when you have i always use the story which is a 90 minutes so in football you have 90 minutes right what do you face in these 90 minutes you face challenges you face obstacles you have a goal that you want to reach but to reach that goal you face a lot of sacrifice whether in the pitch or outside the pitch when, and, and let's say in the minute 60 things aren't going your way can you just uh, stop the game and say, okay, ref, I'm done. I'm leaving the game and you leave. No, you have to finish until the final whistle. And I think this is exactly what life is. You face obstacles, you face challenges, and you face all of these things and you have to be resilient and, and really wait for the last whistle uh, before uh, and never giving up. And I think if I can instill this in these players, then uh, I can build future leaders who can also help players, even let's say like, you know, you can see I, I used to play and I'm a CEO right now. Alia used to play, uh, Lamia used to play, Adwa used to play, Coach Monica used to play, Ani used to play. Most of us used to be players. So I think building leaders and building, um, building leaders is the most important thing. Building people with resilience, building people with a passion, building people who aren't afraid of no and you can't, who see those as challenges. The, this is my, my goal, is to build these leaders, whether they play for 15 years and then give the sport another 20 years after, or if they play, let's say, for two, three years and get an injury, la qadr Allah, or something, and, and can actually make a career out of their passion and their love for football. So I think this is my biggest goal, and this is if I accomplish this, then I can tell you I have accomplished something. And I think you will. Um, Inshallah, the, the I definitely here, uh, But the leadership is also there. And absolutely, then again, like I said previously, you can move mountains. As they say, the biggest risk, of, of course, is not taking a risk. Um, Saudi women are also some of the strongest, if not the strongest females I've ever met in my life. And, and um, like Monica, I've also lived in a few different countries, traveled a few, and honestly, I, I'm blown away by how strong um, other women are, but at the same same time, really also still displaying that compassion, that empathy, that, that makes them really, really unique um, 
from many different angles. Uh, Dr. Eva, shall we delve more, once more in the topic of sports medicine? Um, can you share any insights into the advancements and strategies in sports medicine that contribute to the overall success and performance of young female footballers? Um, maybe emphasizing the importance of their health and well-being in this dynamic field. Yeah. One of the things that I, I think that we have uh, shared already is education. Education has to be one of the uh, basic points for all the clubs and national teams. If young girls don't have enough information regarding performance, regarding injury risks, regarding their health as females, because we are different from male, we are not less or worse or better, we are different and we have different needs. That means that we have to give that information to young girls so then ca they can manage and they can understand. Um, Honey was talking about injury risks and that she had an injury. All clubs and all national teams should have prevention um, programs for injury, ACL for sure, because it's one of the worst. We know, and Honey uh, talked about media, that we hear a lot of ACLs, female more than male, and that's for sure, that's been published, and we know that we have more female than male. Uh, regarding lots of the risk factors, one of them are our anatomy, um, the pitch where we play, and lots of others, because it's multifactorial. But if we don't have that, prevention programs implemented in a, all of the all of the teams worldwide doesn't matter where you are you should have that prevention program for ankle injuries for knee injuries and uh, help them to develop that programs and families should be included in that programs too because uh, maybe when they are in the national teams they are separated from the families, but when they are at the club, the family has to be involved also in what we share with the girls. Parents should know about that. Uh, Hani said that his uh, father wasn't sure that a girl should play, um, but of course she played uh, and she did, she did perfect and astonished, but she got injured. Did she have enough resources? Did uh, the clubs or the national team where she was invest enough? Princess Rim was talking about uh, having the best medical resources and uh, related it to business. We know that we are people, but of course, if we have an injured player, that means that she will be three days, three weeks, three months, or a year that she won't play. That depends to a club. That can be a lot of money. What about investment? If we invest in that resources for young players, for sure, of course, we can be unlucky and we can get injured because there's not one risk factor related to an injury. But if we invest in that programs, in that prevention programs, in medical, um, in a medical team, in team doctors, one of the things that uh, in FC Barcelona changed uh, once I was there, I was uh, for four years the former team doctor for the A team. At first, the team doctor didn't travel to each of the games. Once I was there, we, I traveled with the game, I with the team, all the games, wherever we went, abroad, at home, whatever. That makes a great difference because the players are confident with you. They feel that they have someone that cares for them, and that's an investment. Prince Rim is so, so correct in that. We should think about that it's health, it's performance, but all that is related. And if we do it with young girls, for sure, we will win lots of years and we will protect them. Once they get injured, we don't know for how long, but they will start to so they'll start a recovery process. Mental health is also an issue for that players too. It's not just physical health, it's mental health. Do we help them? Do young girls know about that? 
And that's again, information and education. So we have to invest in so many things. It's just not one thing related to health. It's a lot of things and we have to know about it. So we have to make sure that we are with the best. Thank you for that, Dr. Eva. Certainly, health and education are those important cornerstones that we cannot do without um, being human. It, it really frames what it means to be human and in order to develop and progress in life. Ali, shall we take this conversation on a little side trip and delve into the topic of sports communications? And, and maybe sports communication is not the correct word you hear. But I'm interested in, in the power of visual storytelling. Um, I think we know it's very, very powerful, but how can effective visual storytelling techniques be leveraged to showcase the talent of women in football? And what impact can this have on changing perceptions also and fostering a greater appreciation for um, their achievements? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, sports communication and visual storytelling are very, very important because by creating compelling and engaging narratives that highlights women's skills, dedication and achievements um, are very important to give another um, impression about women's football. Because, you know, in the past, we always grew up uh, not seeing women's football on TV, um, not having access uh, to uh, women's football matches. Uh, even in stadiums, uh, some uh, women were banned from attending uh, football matches. Uh, even role models. When I played uh, uh, football, I wished that uh, I had a role model uh, to look uh, to look up to and to look uh, that she looks like me or has a, a, a football path or just to be aspired by her. Uh, at that time, I didn't have. So the importance of uh, storytelling and the effective uh, visual storytelling, it highlights the personal journeys, creating uh, the stories that focus on personal journey, uh, journeys of the female football players can help audience connect them with deeper levels, show showcasing their challenges, their passion, their commitment to the game. The viewers can understand better uh, their hard work, their dedication, and what it requires to become successful in football. And I can, um, an example of that is what we published on FIFA Plus, the story of Saudi Arabia for the last uh, four years and how uh, their challenges, the obstacles covered, uh, how they achieved their dreams, the emotions that were portrayed. Uh, of course, there are um, uh, uh, amazing football players as well, like uh, Megan Rapinoe, Ada Hebiger. Some care, uh, all these like players. If we focus, we focus on visualizing their stories. The audience get inspired, and that's why it leads to the second point, which is emphasizing also on the skills and technique. Also showing football, women's football, not just from a perspective of uh, 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 women's rights, human rights, but also showing that they are capable, they are skillful, their techniques are amazing. Utilizing these visual highlights on a technical um, uh, uh, aspects also get, give more respect to women's football because it's not just women's playing football, girls playing football. They also have techniques, they have abilities, they have they are professional, um, they understand the game, and they know what what to do. And that's why I could could give the example of Marta, for example, the amazing Marta and uh, uh, award winner for so many years. Alex Morgan also comes here to portray them. Uh, skills and the technique, of course, many of them. And then we have the third point, which is uh, amplifying on the achievements. So visual storytelling can be used to showcase the achievements and the milestones of women's football. We mentioned uh, the pioneer woman in the uh, Saudi Football Association, uh, Sheikh Harim as uh, uh, the CEO of the club. Those stories are very important to show that uh, those women are role models to inspire others, but also showing um, the goals scored as well, showing record broken. And that, that always gives uh, inspiration to many girls to look up to. And last but not least, we also have to show the humanization of the athletes. You know, show them in their uh, uh, emotions, uh, how they capture the success, the intimate moments, the emotions, the interactions uh, on, the, on the field, off the field, portraying them as uh, 
multidimensional individuals with diverse interests, personalities, audiences can develop a stronger connection, of course, and empathy with the people. And that is also required. So, so uh, and there are several examples of that. The, 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 the movie that we showed on FIFA Plus, but also the, um, uh, the story that we created uh, at the Women's World Cup, Women's World Cup films. We followed all the teams um, in the 23 FIFA World Cup to take fans closer behind the scene. This is all important, live streaming, uh, games, football, panel discussions. When we had the two panel discussions at the FIFA uh, World Cup, the convention in, in, in Sydney. Um, we also have different emotions that we captured women's football. Actually, in fact, if you would allow me, there is a few seconds video of when we captured the moment of uh, Tori Penso, the refer referee, where she learned that she will um, uh, she will referee the final, and that was also impressive to show cases that you know um, a women's football can um, uh, can uh, can uh, you know show emotions whether it's on the football pitch or off the football pitch. I'm not sure if you see my screen now because I'm happy to share um, the video. Can you see my screen? Um, we, we see screen, but not video yet. Okay, so this yes, is there the we video. We see, we see this. So I think such stories, you know, like are very powerful to, you know, just to ensure that we are communicating about women's football, but also to understand that um, uh, uh, these are the inspirations for women's football at all levels. And if we continue portraying that, of course, we can encourage more sponsors, more broadcasters, you know, because until 2019, for example, the Women's World Cup has never been a revenue for FIFA because mostly our revenues at FIFA is generated by the men's World Cup, not by the women's World Cup. And um, for the first time ever in 2023, um, uh, uh, the women's World Cup generated revenues for us. So after what? After people started to realize it's a brand, um, it's a way to communicate, it's a way um, uh, uh, to show the talent, it's a way to um, celebrate women's football, and that's how we generated never use how that we we have we had more than two billion viewers um, watching women's football worldwide. That's why we had um, uh, the best uh, historical women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. So that's all about uh, uh, communicating the stories of the those individuals, of those women, those girls on and off the pitch to ensure that women's football is there. It's also as equal as men's football, as uh, people can see it, people have access to it, people can relate it to it. That's why also we are working a lot in FIFA on social media uh, platforms uh, with media outlets to ensure that the stories are shared and talked uh, to inspire a whole of a new generation to, to see that one day they can look up to this girl, to this woman, to this legend, to this athlete, and want to become like them. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So important and crucial and essential, um, the, the role models in sports. And for the world to understand that a footballer is not just somebody who kicks a ball. It's, it's a human that comes with that full human experience and can influence. The importance of that influence. Thank you for sharing that, honey. That that was really necessary to hear. And I think also if, if we can only hope for the media to start to understand how to report also um, from from a female perspective and uh, to share stories from that perspective. Monica, we heard from money uh, from honey about the power of visual storytelling and in changing perspectives, of course, and highlighting personally, uh, personal journeys. Now, changing perceptions are also crucial for sustained um, progress. 
I think sustainability and, and being sustained is two words that's not going to go anywhere. It, it frames everything. Um, it involves adapting uh, to new realities, embracing diversity, fostering a mindset that is receptive to positive change. What strategies and um, initiatives do you believe are crucial for the continued development and growth of women's football in Saudi Arabia? And how do you envision overcoming any of the challenges to ensure sustained progress in the coming years? I think your role is so important in this, if you can share with us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, two key words, uh, it can be all over the world, is first of all, being patient, because uh, you're not going to win the World Cup in a few years. It takes time. It took Germany over 30 years. I was not allowed to play when I was 11 years old. So that kind of gave me my history of always fighting for women football. Uh, getting all these culture barriers, these prejudices uh, to tell that the girls can play the game. And like Honey said, now our level has been get much better that even men in my country, in Germany, say, oh, I'd rather watch women football because it's more attractive. It's, it has more excitement. It has uh, purity. It's not so spoiled, not so much theater. So, so are we are heading now in women football in absolute in the right direction. And of course, you need to hard work. If you don't work hard, nowhere you go anywhere. And uh, been fighting for, let's say now, 60 uh, 55 years in women football, that means for me that uh, we always have to start again all over. It is not happening and it's finished over. To win the championship is nice, but we always have to work hard. I know Spain 30 years ago, they were somewhere in the dark, not in women football, in the Clovers or on the uh, map. And now they won the World Cup after 13 years, really continuously doing news program. And that's where we have to look. We look at the pyramid. Of course, the national teams are important. We talked about role models. That is important, the players' pathway, but more important is the grassroots, the basis, the basis to get as many, many girls to play football, talented one, or just to have fun, just to give them these opportunity to play. So, of course, the program like FIFA is doing um, football for school. I mean, that is something we go around now to whole Saudi Arabia and uh, Saudi Arabia is not a small country. Uh, we're going around and, 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 and getting these girls in football and the, and the parents say, oh, my, my daughter has fun. Oh, it's, it's great. So, so we are changing the mindset. What is football for the girls or for the women? And, and of course, to having these basis program, grassroots program, gives you the sustainability and, of course, the success. Without that, you will not uh, go anywhere. And, of course, the leadership. If I see here the president, if I see the GS and my three lovely ladies, Adwa, Alia and Lamia, how they are supportive. They are from the top leadership to say we want women football. And if you don't have this, I tell you, you don't go anywhere. You don't go anywhere in the world to make any progress. And uh, I was coming here in September 21, and I, the national team players, we get the same allowance as the men. I says, what? America was fighting three years in court to get the same salary? What is this? And we get the same pitches. Like Reem saying, we have such great uh, 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 facilities and 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 conditions with the, the same hotel as the men are going. So so we are women feeling are the same. Of course, the salary Ronaldo and maybe Seba is not quite the same, but not now, not yet. But this is not. I feel we don't have to have the same salary. I'm I'm not looking at this. I'm looking at the equality that every woman and every girl who wants to play can play and given this opportunity. So our grassroots programs is, uh, will be the success, not now, but in five years, in 10 years, like Reem saying, these are the future national players and that's what we're gonna heading for. And if uh, Saudi Arabia is patient and if they are hardworking and support from the leadership, I'm sure we will get there and uh, we'll make a lot of women and girls happy. Yes, thank you for that. And it, it seems also we have four really interesting questions here. I'm just not sure who will answer these questions, but it seems that the, our participants are very, very interested 
in the medical angle, we, we, we keep on going back to that. Uh, and it is an interesting angle. I'm so very glad now that we do have Dr. Eva on board here, but that all four of you can, can discuss this. So uh, again, um, we go back there, Dr. Eva, what are the medical challenges facing female football players and how can they be better addressed? So, so maybe you can go into a little bit more detail of, of what cases you see. Of course, injuries is one of the top um, challenges that we can have for, for female. We have talked about it. We have to have more research. We need more research uh, because research, and you think, okay, research is like just in a lab. No, research can go to grassroots because we need that research also for kids and understand uh, why they get, they get injured, why are there some injuries related more to gay girls than males. Um, so we need that research, but of course it's not just related to injuries, it's related to health. One of the things that uh, I try to make coaches and staff understand is again go to the basis that's to listen if the girls need to address a coach a medical staff whoever something that's going on with their health they shouldn't be shy they have and need to address with no taboos whatever that happens and i think that's one of the challenges that we have do girls have the same pathways to talk to the rest of the staff the coaches related to their health we know that female health has specific moments and that means that we need to understand and we need to listen where the needs are and that's one for example that's one of my areas of research related for example to menstrual cycle that's one of the things that we have to address too. And that's very important for that research. But because, for example, one of the things that uh, is being uh, very and highly addressed now is if that can be one of the risks related to an injury. So that's one of the things that we have to, to address too. But there are other things that we have to address and um, there, there shouldn't be taboos and we should have uh, medical staff and coaches staff that would be listening to them as normally for other types of health that a male could have. So medical challenges related to female health, first of all, know about female health. If someone feels better with a female doctor, okay, that's okay. Doesn't, there's no problem with that, but someone should be there to listen to them, and of course, related to, to injuries. Thank you. Can, can you maybe just also um, touch on the, the pregnancy scenario and uh, what role that plays, um, postpartum, for instance? Yeah, well, what, that's one of the big challenges that we have right now. Um, a footballer can equally decide if she wants to get pregnant or not. That's an individual decision. Do the clubs have enough information and education related to how to train when a football uh, footballer gets pregnant and how to return to play when they have delivered? That's basic because if we have a football player that gets pregnant and wants to come back after delivery, she should have the same resources to have a, to come at or be back at the same level. And that's something that I know that FIFA is working in, UEFA we are working it too, and other and the clubs and national teams are working on that because it can be one of the faces of a woman that decides to get pregnant. Why does she has to stop her career due to that pregnancy? It doesn't make any sense. She can have her baby and come back but we have to give them the resources the good resources enough resources to be sure that the medical staff will be with them but the coaches too 
And that's basic, that all the coaches and physical uh, coaches know how, how to, or, or the program, what they need to address when they have a pregnant woman in their team and how they come back at the same level or better level once they have delivered. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Eva. And, and that brings me, Princess Reem, to another question about how can the partnership between clubs and medical institutions be enhanced to ensure comprehensive health care? Yes, so I think um, when it comes to the clubs, it's more of education at this point. So I think just making sure that the leadership is educated, that the team is educated on the importance of finding the right fit, because you can find a lot of um, great doctors um, who have worked with athletes, but also the dynamic between them, the understanding between them and the coach and the players is what's really important uh, and building that relationship and making sure that the communication there is smooth. Because as a doctor, of course, you're always looking for um, like you're being a, not always conservative, but really protecting the player medical wise. And then you have the player sometimes who really wants to play regardless of the of the injury and feels like they can push through. And then you have the coach who is in between the two, where he has that passion where, you know, maybe it's a side injury. Can we push the player? If the communication between the medical team and the coach aren't aligned, then you're really just um, not helping the player because not only are you, uh, is the medical team telling him, let's say you can't play, the coach is saying you can play. And then this causes some some confusion for them and stress for them and in making these decisions. So I feel like maybe the most important thing is you can always find a lot of great doctors, but making sure that the doctor has a very good relationship with the coach and with the players and making the coaches also understand the importance of listening to the med to the to the um, uh, doctors in the club because by the end of the day, as if we all want to succeed, we need our players to succeed and we need them to be in the right shape and the right mindset to do that. Not just in terms of injury, but also I think another point that you touched upon is the emotional part. Um, you know, players go through so much stress, even after injuries, let's say, into going back to the uh, form that they were at and to performing the same way. So making sure that even with the re rehabilitation, it's not just about strengthening this muscle or, or getting you back in shape. It's really about also your mental, because I feel maybe Dr. Ava, you're better, you're better than, than me at this, but I feel like a big part of recovery, uh, if you're mentally not right, then even if you fully recovered, you're may maybe even more prone to get an injury because you are scared. You are, you are not confident of, um, of the re rehabilitation that you had. So I would say mostly it's finding the right uh, doctor that is that fits with the team and making sure that the players and the coaches know the importance of listening to the doctor and, and taking their advice into rehabilitating the player. Thank you. Great answer there. Um, I wonder, Dr. Eva, a quick comment perhaps on the mental health? It's absolutely true that it has to be together, physical and mental health. They cannot work separately. We are a human being. We have emotions. We can have a physical issue, but we can have mental issues and emotions. We know under what high pressure a player can be, even when they are injured or when they are performing at their top level. Whatever happens, they can be in a big, 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 uh, under a big pressure. That means that they have or they need someone that can, they can rely on and they can explain what's going on with them, if they need whatever help. That's another thing that can be a taboo, telling whoever, a professional, okay, I need help because I have mental issues, emotional issues. We are, as human beings, we have families. We work, some of them. Uh, we have other issues that can stress ourselves as human beings as normal people that can have a psychologist, for example, and they rely on someone, why shouldn't players have 
there are psychologists or a team psychologists that can help. And that's the same for coaches and for physical coaches, uh, everyone that's part of a football team. But of course, when we relate that mental issues to um, an injury, Princess Ring was, was talking about, lots of them, when they come back, they feel scared. They feel scared if they get re-injured or if they won't perform as good as they were before. And that means that maybe they are not going to play or the coach doesn't rely on them. On them. So when I was saying that we, we have to accompany them, that means that we have to be sure that what they need, whatever it is, they can have it. We'll do the best for them. Maybe it's not what they need, but at least it's the best that we can give them. Yes, absolutely. And uh, both of these um, questions now spoke about the coaches. Monica, let's, let's talk about the coaches. There's a question here about how can the training and development structure for female football coaches be improved? And I think at LDI, we will listen to, to this answer because, of course, it's our mandate also to, to assist in the, the human capability development here. Uh, but can you shed light here on, on this question, please? Well, first of all, we need serious people around us, serious people who take us serious as women, we want to be a coach, we want to be a player, we want to be a manager, whatever, in whatever position. I, I just uh, had a conversation yesterday with someone uh, who is working with the national team of a team, I'm not saying which country, and she is not getting the possibility to do her C license. I, this is for me unbelievable. This is something counterproductive. A very young national player is wanting to be a coaching staff in future and want to learn and get the opportunity to be with the national team, but doesn't get from his from her own FA the support. And this is what I found so great when we started. Lamia said we have to do courses. So I did coaching courses, 28 B license, 100 over 100 C license courses, and we had all these young young women who are still players, of course, who are looking at another career, and now. We, we said we have to educate them. This is something as well as important that the coaches and all what you said, Reem, a mental factor, a coach has so much influence on the player. And if you don't give these education, the right education to the coaches, how you can be successful? No way. And especially with these young players, I believe the best coaches have to be in the age from nine to 14, not when they are adults. Then it's too late. It's over. Time is finished. You need the best coaches. And Iceland, they did this. The best coaches, they put in these young age group. And then suddenly they were going to the European Championship. Uh, they have only 480,000 inhabitants, I believe, Iceland. Very small, small island in Europe. Because they understood how is the structure that the coach is the one of the most important influence for the player. And if I give this education to these, play, uh, to these coaches, I can not guarantee, but I can at least give them the opportunity to, to have this development for the players to understand how to be a coach. And what Saudi is doing in this way, it's, it's really unbelievable how they support this. We're just sending now two of our coaches to the FA to Belgium to learn, to shadow with the national team to understand how it is to be a coach, to get the experience, to go out on the field, let them make mistake. You know, some people say you cannot make mistake as a coach. Well, as a player, I'm learning the same as a coach. Yeah? And I'm sure, Reem, you know more what I'm talking about, that, that to understand that player on the mental side, on the medical side, but not it's about me as a coach, it's about the player and the players play the game. If a coach understands this, I think he is or she is very advanced to be having good players in her team. Thank you, Monica. Yes, that, uh, it would be really interesting for us also to, to take a deep dive and to see what Iceland is doing. Um, I always find it encouraging when, when you have a nation that you don't normally think about within this context, coming up with the best practice and interesting solution to a situation, and then taking a look at what do they do and how can we apply it here? And again, we are back to the point of being young. 
Uh, and that leaves me, honey, with, with the last question here for you. What strategies can be adopted to attract more young female players to engage in football? Um, I mean, I believe strategies are there, you know, but how to connect it with a whole general narrative, it's also important. For example, FIFA are set to commerce in a partnership with uh, Visit Saudi Arabia, you know, and uh, how Visit Saudi Arabia is also connected to the development of women's football. This is encouraging at all, level, at all levels because this will be acknowledging um, the initiatives that have started uh, by strengthening the partnership. There will be a lot of collaboration. Uh, competitions uh, that involve girls playing football, uh, that part of the strategy will increase the participation of girls. That's why FIFA introduced uh, 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 more competitions for the upcoming years. Now, every year we will have, starting from 25 under 17 Women's World Cup, we will have Futsal uh, World Cup for the first time ever, FIFA Club World Cup for girls and women that will also start so, like such strategies embedded into member associations, starting from the, uh, 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 as uh, Monica mentioned, from grassroots to top elite level, that what will change uh, the women's landscape to ensure that strategies are there in different member associations, make them attractive, make them um, possible uh, for the girls to be um, enthusiastic to, uh, to join. Uh, whether it's uh, connecting it to a whole bigger strategy like visit Saudi Arabia, whether um, connecting it to role models, to football players, to legends, uh, whether connecting it to Ministry of Sports to ensure we also have football for schools at all levels, connected to FIFA, UEFA, uh, IOC, member uh, big government bodies. That will be always encouraging for girls to be part of the game but also you know it's it's very enthusiastic about uh, the, for the girls to join when they know that they are representing their countries at all levels they are participating in tournaments i think tournaments is a great um uh, uh, it's a great aspect for girls to engage you know even if you lose uh, one time two times of course the goal is to win but we never learn uh, we don't learn if we don't lose we don't uh, uh, grow if we don't uh, face failures um, and that's part of uh, the process, you know, as uh, Sheikh Harim said, it's about life. Uh, uh, football is like life. You learn, you lose, you win. But how to continue, how to ensure that um, when girls get, uh, when a woman gets, uh, a football player gets pregnant, how she can continue. And that's where medical comes in. So the strategies have to cover all parts of all the process, whether from medical perspective, psychological perspective, uh, uh, content perspective, media perspective, uh, communication perspective, legal perspective, how to protect the players. For example, uh, uh, we initiated a big program on social media, how to protect women from uh, blackmailing uh, footballers, from abuse on social media. So when you create the whole protection in the strategies for women's football and you create a safety program, also safeguarding I mentioned here is very important, for girls to play football to ensure that their safety, their security, uh, their uh, their well-being is protected. This is really important. So once you secure all that, automatically girls will be encouraged, parents will be encouraged, society will be encouraged. And that's why when, when we will see more and more girls participating, more national teams, more clubs, more leagues. We have witnessed those examples in Saudi Arabia. I've witnessed this in Palestine, how we grew up with the national team, how we provided the security and safety for parents to ensure that the girls are safe. So all these aspects from medical safeguarding, uh, women empowerment, activities, competitions, uh, media interest, uh, documentaries, th this has all to be part of the strategies to ensure um, uh, attractive uh, 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 scenes for girls to, to be involved and to engage, but also know that on the bigger level, one day they will represent their nations. And that is the ultimate goal for all these girls to be proud, to be pride, to one day just you know sing their national anthem with all the emotions all the passions there with uh, 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 in their stadiums or outside uh, uh, in the world and that's where the ultimate goal for all these girls to to be part of this beautiful game uh, that unites everyone thank you honey and i'm really glad that you mentioned um the security and the safeguarding aspect um we recently met with a group of people at LDI. We are actually developing standards and our next phase rollout with people coaches. And safeguarding is 
for sure an item on the list that we're taking a look at. So uh, thank you for highlighting that. It means that we are most definitely on the right track there as well. And I think this brings us basically to the end here. I was almost considering giving each one of you another minute or two as a closing remark, but I, I think time-wise we need to start to move towards the end. And we had such great questions now that I don't think um, we can uh, we can spend more time on a on a closing remark. Um, from my side, I just want to say um, what an enlightening and empowering discussion. I extend my heartfelt um, gratitude to our incredible um, panelists, Monica Kaplan, Cesarine, Dr. Eva, Ani. Um, thank you for sharing your invaluable insights and experiences with our um, people today. Um, we embarked on a journey through the evolving landscape of women's football. We witnessed the commitment, the resilience, the determination of women in sport and the passion. I think that's the one word that we kept on highlighting. Um, stories are just not uh, only tales of time, but beacons of inspiration that illuminate the path for the future generations. Our um, discussion spanned various crucial aspects from the evolution of women's football in Saudi to very personal and professional challenges faced by women in the field, um, locally and internationally. We celebrated the progress made in women's football, we addressed the obstacles and we showcased success stories, honey, such as your excellent story. Dr. Eva illuminated the intersection of sports and healthcare, emphasizing the importance of promoting the health and well-being of female football players. We explored the significance of visual storytelling and highlighting the achievements of women in sports and discussed initiatives to foster inclusivity, encouraging women of all backgrounds to actively participate in sports. Um, in celebration of International Women's Day, I encourage each of you to carry forward the spirit of today's discussion. And as mentioned before, let's not stop here. Let's keep on talking about this. Um, let us be advocates for progress, equality and empowerment in Saudi women's sports. The insights shared here today are not just words. Um, they are a call to action, an invitation for all of us to contribute to the ongoing narrative of female athletic development in the kingdom. And that leads me to the last paragraph where I really want to express my gratitude to Dr. Mesna Omarzuki the Director General of LDI, and all of my colleagues for realizing this event. I, I wish I could mention each one of them separately, but where do I start and who do I leave out? The entire team has been absolutely fabulous. Um, and a thank you for our engaged audience for actively participating in this dialogue. Your, your questions really um, helped us to, to, to close and to, to, to shed more light also on, on um, the topic. Let us continue to amplify the voices of women in sports, celebrate their achievements and work together to create a future where every woman, regardless of background, has the opportunity to thrive in the world of sports. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>